welcome students to chapter three of abnormal behavior. We are looking at models of abnormality in this chapter. So you're going to see several different models of um, mental illness, conceptualization, and then uh, treatment approaches for each one that we will learn much more about as we get into the book further. So models or paradigms um, of abnormality are used by scientists and clinicians to treat abnormality. Um, they explain events and basic assumptions. They guide the techniques um, for treatment and principles. Um, and there are, there's uh, several models of abnormality that we're going to take a look at. Biological model is the first uh, method. Um, it is uh, looking at the biological basis and medical perspective. It considers that illness is brought about by malfunctioning parts of the organism. And so we're looking at brain anatomy and brain chemistry in particular in this model. Um, everything from the um, tiny little neurons, the brain cells, um, and then the glia cells that surround them um, to the different brain structures. Um, specifically, there's a lot of emphasis on the cerebrum, which is the cortex, the corpus callosum, um, we look at also the basal ganglia, the hippocampus, and the amygdala. A lot of this is where the higher level thinking goes on. Um, and then we uh, examine connections that are found among some psychological disorders and specific brain structures. So um, we're looking at brain chemistry um, a lot of the time in this field. We're um, mapping neuron to neuron transmission to see um, how things work. Uh, at the neuron level. Um, so this is a brain cell right here, and you can see at the very end we've got the little cell body and the dendrites. Um, there's the axon, which um, uh, uh, receives the action potential and um, transmits that electrical impulse down that little tube. Um, and then you can see toward the end there, there's the neurotransmitters. Those get dumped out into the synapse, um, and then they are either um, kind of left in the synapse, or the next neuron um, receives them and takes them up into the next neuron. So um, there's a lot of focus on that for drug therapies. And there are literally dozens of neurotransmitters in the brain, but for our uh, purposes, a lot of the time, um, scientists look at serotonin, norepinephrine, and glutamate. Um, and they look at the abnormal activity among these neurotransmitters to identify specific mental disorders. Um, they also will take a look at chemical activity that happens in the endocrine system, which is um, where our hormones are um, generated. And um, if there's abnormal secretion, for example, of the hormone cortisol, um, that can be linked to anxiety and other mood disorders. Increasingly, there's research focus on brain circuits, um, relatively new in the field, as key to psychological disorders rather than a single brain or brain chemical dysfunction. Um, so these uh, brain circuit neurotransmitters, the structures and the fun functions all kind of um, are being examined. Proper interconnectivity among the circuit structures is important. And um, these and other brain characteristics can be the result of genetics there's more um, in Achieve that you'll learn about genetics, but I did want to mention that that is a factor. This slide shows a circuit that has to do with the biology of fear. So if you see um, on the left, you've got the anterior cingulate, cor cingulate cortex and the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala. There's one other structure that isn't visible on the model called the insula, but all of those structures interact. Um, and you can see on the right-hand side how there's a flow um, from the amygdala and insula all the way to the free prefrontal cortex. Um, and, and that is how we become afraid. And if it happens over and over again, we could develop um, longstanding anxiety issues because we've got that pathway that has been um, reinforced very strongly. Um, in terms of biological treatments, um, you know, practitioners attempt to identify the physical source, again, of dysfunction to determine treatment. And there's three leading treatments today, the most significant of which is drug therapy. 
but uh, people um, who oftentimes um, don't achieve success with that uh, may be have uh, uh, some kind of trial of brain stimulation or psychosurgery as a last resort. The next model that we're going to talk about is the psychodynamic model, and it was developed by Sigmund Freud. Um, he um, kind of, in pieces, developed the theory of psychoanalysis, um, and he proposed that we have these unconscious forces that drive our behavior, and that our abnormal symptoms are the result of conflict between them. So the three um, unconscious forces that shape our personality are the id, which is the pleasure principle, the ego, which is the reality principle, and the superego, which is the morality principle. And just to give you um, a little example, let's say you walked into the store and you saw, you know, uh, a rack of bananas and you thought, boy, I really am starving. I, I want one of those bananas. Well, the id might encourage you to just pick up the banana and eat it right away because it's interested in just the internal drive that you have to, to satisfy your your hunger. But the superego would say, mm -mm, no, you shouldn't do that. Uh, and then the id would mediate between the two and say, you know, I, I think we could probably manage to, uh, to to wait until we get to the cash register and pay for that. Uh, and then, you know, you can eat the banana. So the id is sort of um, looking at the reality of what society expects of us and moderating uh, those other two principles. Um, in terms of conflict, uh, some degree of conflict is always going to be present. Um, healthy people have a balance. Dysfunction occurs, though, uh, when there's excessive conflict among those principles. Um, he said that, um, in addition, um, new events and pressures are always occurring as we develop uh, from the time we're tiny. And if we're successful going through each developmental stage, we'll have personal growth. And if we're unsuccessful, we will have fixation, um, and that leads to psychological problems. So, for example, the first stage is the oral stage, and that's when babies are being fed, you know, with a bottle or whatever, and they they are reliant entirely on a caregiver to to feed them. So, if that's unreliable, then Freud would say that the baby is going to develop a trust problem and have an oral fixation. And they may um, have oral needs like chewing gum or things like that that persist during life because of uh, those trust needs uh, that they're still working out um, in an oral manner. The next model that we're going to talk about is the cognitive behavioral model, which focuses on maladaptive behaviors and cognitions and understanding um, psychological abnormality. It shares key principles between behavior and cognitive perspectives. In the behavioral dimension, we're looking at conditioning, and you'll learn more about that later. There's um, a few kinds. There's classical conditioning, there's modeling, and there's operant conditioning. And in this model, the therapist becomes like a teacher and tries to replace problematic behaviors with more adaptive ones. Um, in the cognitive dimension, they're worth thinking um, you know, about how they can change your inaccurate or disturbing assumptions that you may have or your illogical thoughts. Um, and if they can change, help you change those ways of thinking, then, you know, you're going to feel better because you're not having negative thoughts that produce negative feelings. So you'll, your mental health will be improved. The humanistic and existential model um, is an, another one that we'll talk about. In the humanist view, um, there's an emphasis on people as friendly, cooperative, and constructive. There's a focus on um, the drive to self-actualize or reach your potential through honest recognition of your strengths and weaknesses. And um, what's paired with the humanistic view oftentimes is the existentialist view, where there's emphasis on accurate self-awareness and a meaningful life. Um, so we're looking at um, being authentic and uh, leading an authentic life. And um, they view that, you know, we really do. We're given total freedom from birth um, and that we can make choices that are going to have negative or positive behaviors and outcomes in our life. Um, 
psychological dysfunction, in their view, is caused by self-deception. So if we're honest with ourselves and we make good choices, um, then um, we will have better mental health. And then there's the socio-cultural model, um, which involves family, social, and multicultural perspectives. Um, this is where uh, the social and cultural forces influence individuals. Um, and so we're looking at what does society expect of people? Um, and how do we change those things if needed so that people are healthier? The family social theorists explain abnormal functioning um, by looking again at, at the family's impact, um, looking at the different labels and roles that families uh, give people, um, looking at um, social connections and supports within the family and external to the family, um, and also how the family structures um, contribute to positive uh, relationships and communication or not. And um, family systems theory uh, examines whether families are too enmeshed or too close together, or they're too disengaged and too far apart from one another. In the multicultural perspective, we're looking at behavior and treatment that are best understood in the context of cultural um, or values and external pressures. Um, we are examining, uh, you know, how members of cultural minority groups are treated, and the assumption is always that we're not going to view people as inferior or deprived in comparison with the majority population. And there's increasing interest in understanding people um, through the lens of intersectionality, which examines how each individual's memberships across multicultural groups and social identities combine to shape their personal experiences, opportunities, outlook, and functioning. So for example, um, one could be a professor, um, one could be a member of a church, one could be um, a, a parent, um, one could be a board member, and how do all of those different um, experiences uh, relate to each other and develop an individual's identity. Um, in terms of treatment, um, members of ethnic and racial minority groups um, may tend to show less improvement in clinical treatment or make less use of mental health services and stop therapy sooner than members of majority groups. And so um, researchers are working on ways to, to change that. Um, therapist in effectiveness, we know, is enhanced when there's greater sensitivity to cultural issues, um, greater inclusion of uh, cultural morals and models and cultural sensitive therapies and gender sensitive therapies. So all of those things are foremost in the field now. And um, when we integrate uh, the models, um, we, we come up with a perspective of developmental psychopathology so that there's all kinds of different impacts and ways that we look at people through different lenses. And many theories, theorists suggest that abnormal behavioral theories should include multiple causes at a time um, and so this framework um, is, has been developed to understand how different variables and principles from the different models account for adaptive and maladaptive functioning. Um, we do have central perspective principles of equifinality and multifinality, and you can um, learn more about that in your textbook. Um, but basically the, the point is that we could start out one way um, and have different influences and end up in, um, you know, very different positions, or we can start out in two different ways and have different influences and end up in the same position. So it really just depends on what life um, uh, offers us in terms of our genetics and then our experiences um, as to how we, we turn out. So that will conclude Chapter 3, and I will pick it back up in Chapter 4. Thank you.